It's time now for Speakeasy with Jerry Elsie. Hi, thank you for joining me today. I have a real pleasure today to introduce you to Mr. Joe McCockadill, Speaker of the House of Representatives of our state of Alabama. You've been there seven years as Speaker of the House. Right. And how long have you been in politics? Too long, Jerry. I've been, <laughs> I've been there 23 years. Uh -huh. Well, I don't want to talk about that right, right now. I okay. want to talk about maybe some, some of your hobbies and All maybe right. about your early life in Jackson. Did you grow up in Jackson always? Well, I grew up in a little community out from Jackson called Selecta. Uh -huh. You might know where that is since yes. you're familiar with my area, the state uh -huh. down there. It's about 12 miles from Jackson, near the Tom Bigby River on Highway 69. But uh, I went to school out there nine years, and then I went to Jackson to high school. And I've uh, been in Jackson ever since, really, except for the time spent in the service in World War II. Mm -hmm. So many <coughs> people um, that later do really good, big things in life have great dreams and ambitions as a child. Did you? Well, I think we all do. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, that's, uh, that's part of the makeup of this country and part of our people in, uh, in America. And, uh, of course, it's part of some ambition also. Right, it's healthy. You, it is. If you do not have some goals in life, of course, you'll find it passing you by, I think, and, uh, and not really knowing where you've been or what you're, what you're planning for the future. Well, did you dream of, of a place in and active in Alabama politics? Well, let's uh, dwell on that just a moment. Uh -huh. I often refer to my interest in politics beginning because I say my, pa my father was a depression politician. Mm -hmm. By that I mean that he had been in the lumber and sawmill business and this type of business, and of course when that failed, he uh, ran for county commissioner's position down there and was elected. And that really meant survival for us during mm -hmm. the depression. And from that time forward, of course, I was very much interested in politics. I was a real youngster when all this occurred, and uh, he was quite interested in state politics and also on national level. He stayed in politics about 33 years mm -hmm. in Clark County. And so as a result of that, I think really that's where my interest began. And then uh, after my service in World War II, I, like many others, tried to come back to Jackson to live, and it was very difficult to make a living. And it became very evident that there was nothing for young people to do there, and I wanted to try to uh, seek some industry and some assistance and some growth for that area so that it would attract some, some young people back there. And that's, that's kind of how it began. Okay, and about your family, when did you meet Betty? And, yeah. Well, Betty and I were in school together all during high school in Jackson. Her father was, uh, was my family doctor. And uh, of course, it went, went on a long, long time. Right. And uh, <clears throat> we'd laugh about that a lot. Uh, you know, Betty, uh, is, her family is very conservative and of course did not believe in a lot of publicity and they go through the idea that your name should be in the paper three times and that's when you're born, when you get married, and when you die. And uh, she often has said that the one promise she asked me to make when we were married was that I'd never get in politics. Okay. But uh, it's been very, very rewarding. Very and she much has so. done real well too. She People has. think a lot of she her. Has. You have two sons, right? That's right. Gaines and Mac. And they're in law practice in Jackson together. Okay. Let's talk about your hobby a little right. bit. Your great turkey hunter. Oh, I love it. You know what I learned to do the other day? With Brooks Holloman, I learned to call turkeys. <coughs> well, good. Have you ever seen the turtle-shaped turkey yes, I have. Mm -hmm, well, that's what mm -hmm, we use. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I hate to hear you say that because this is going to make a difference in your life. You know, <laughs> you become addicted to turkey hunting. Your uh -huh. father, uh, of course, realized that, but it's, a, it's just the greatest sport in the world. All right. How much time do you spend in Montgomery so that you have time to do the thing, your hobby, you know? I can't, I, I'm, I'm really ashamed to admit that I only went turkey hunting this, this spring four times because uh, when we went to annual sessions of the mm -hmm. legislature, it had just interfered with my turkey hunting like uh, you wouldn't believe me. But you treasured those times I you sure got did. Did you I have sure any did. luck? Are you Kill one turkey. Are you a good shot? Well, uh, I don't know. I have missed my share of turkeys as anyone that's Do you tell stories? Me. Oh, I love to tell stories, yes. All right, well, I have something I want to ask <clears> you about <throat> now. I talked to Billy Hall this morning. Oh, my your goodness. Your friend and mine, Dr. Hall. Right. And he said, to ask you about when the flood came up and the cows and the horses got trapped and you and Dr. Vickers were trying to get the horses. 
Well, this is a long story, but it is true. <laughs> this was in 1961, and we had a river that was higher than any in history at that time. And I had two horses out near Horseshoe Lake, which was uh, not far from the river. And the water was about three miles to the edge of the backwater to where the horses were. And I uh, had some hogs in there too and had gotten most of the hogs out. But I had one horse that didn't want to swim. And uh, Dr. Vickers and I, John Vickers, decided that we'd make a sling for those people that might be viewing that have uh, handled cows in water mm -hmm. and all would know what I mean. And so we put two boats together and tied them together with some small trees and then put a rope from one to the other and made a sling where it would go underneath the horse. Mm -hmm. And so the horse would quit swimming, you, you know, we could carry it along with the boat. And uh, we did fine for a while. The horse swam away, then quit and just relaxed in that sling. And then all of a sudden, something spooked the horse and he got his front feet in one boat and his hind feet in another oh. boat. And here we were out in the water and I don't know yet how we survived, but we, we did not try to get that horse out of there again. And uh, we finally put them up in a barn with some corn and... All right, now, <coughs> Dr. Hall said that you got the horses up in the top of the barn. We did. Now, he asked me, how did you get them down? No, I'm going, I've am got to take a break. All right. We're going to come back. Okay. Be All right. right back. Well, we've left the horses in the top of the barn. Now, I want to know how you got them down. <laughs> well, it has, I, I, since I thought about it after it all occurred, I think the horses were almost as frightened. It, we had two horses, I'm only sure. one got us in trouble. <laughs> but we had two, and I think they were almost as frightened as we mm -hmm. were. And it had been a few hundred co uh, b bushels of corn left in this barn. And they literally climbed that corn and got up above that high water. But there's an ending to that story also that maybe Dr. Hall didn't mention. Uh, maybe the preacher didn't know about this, but <clears throat> as the water uh, left that area, the corn fermented after being wet. Oh, no. And it, uh, it smelled, you know, well, you could smell it for some distance. <laughs> and the, uh, at that time, Sheriff came out one day to fish uh, after the water had gone down and started smelling that. He said, there's a still around here somewhere. And he said, it's right <laughs> over there, I think. But it was that fermented corn, oh. so we had to... We had a lot of animals there that, after it was swept out of the barn, that ate it, and they were happy for a long time after <laughs> that, Jerry. <laughs> Wonderful, happy, happy, That's relaxed, right. tranquilized That's right. horses. All right, I have one more thing to okay. ask you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hall says that you have a pretty lake where you fish. Well, I think I have. All right. He says sometimes you've taken Doug Barfield down there, and that he fishes in the boat. <laughs> and that you've taken Bear Bryant, and he said to ask you if he fished in a boat. Well, I told some people the other day, <laughs> Coach Bryant was down this spring with me uh -huh. fishing, and I said it's very easy to fish with Coach Bryant because we fished on one side of the lake for a while, and then they, they were not biting too good over there, and so Coach Bryant just walked across to the other side to see how they were biting <laughs> on the other side of the lake. But uh, we did have, he was down this year with me, and uh, we've, had, we've had a lot of fun. Well, you're in the prettiest country in the world, Thank I you. think, in Alabama down there, in good hunting country. These are natural lakes, and uh, we enjoy the escape that we have an opportunity to all right, let's talk a little bit about um, Alabama. Great. Uh, what do you see as the major problems right now that we need to overcome? We have not told the Alabama story often enough and to enough people. And uh, I'm going to mention that today before club here in Selma. Uh, as we look at the growth of the Sun Belt region, uh, southeastern region of the United States, and we see what's happened in the other states. When we are here with more natural resources and the finest people, and we find that we are low on the totem pole as far as growth and development, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with what God has given us. It's something wrong with us for not telling the story and letting people know what a great section of mm -hmm. the country we have, Jerry. Well, I'm particularly concerned for my own sake because the economy is so bad everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's affecting my husband's business, my friends. My business, the, everyone. Everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that Alabama has had a hard time lately making it right. financially. Our roads are in <clears> bad <throat> shape, the schools, everything. Um, Let me mention okay. what happens to us 
Now, there's nothing that is a cure-all, and I don't mean it that way. But we have, for many years in Alabama, depended on consumer taxes. That's at the ultimate sale there, such as sales tax and your personal income tax and, of course, gasoline tax and utility tax. These are all consumer mm -hmm. taxes. So these are very, very sensitive revenue measures which means that when we reach a period as we're in right now, as you mentioned, the economy, then we suffer immensely as a result of the economy. Mm -hmm. They're not stable taxes. Now, if we can develop economically and develop with industry, creating retail outlets and our tax base such as it is, it will solve our monetary problem. It'll just circulate. That's right. That's right. It'll be benefit to yes, everybody. Yes, it will. All right, let's change the subject okay. a bit. Uh, who do you most admire? in the country. Now that's something, that's something to throw at you and, and why. Have you ever, all right, let me put it this all way. Right. People have always admired you. Well, I appreciate you it. You have a beautiful name. Everybody thinks a lot of you says, I hate to tell you this, people say that you're a sweet man. Now that's a lovely thing to say about somebody, Thank I you. think. You know? Thank you. And uh, when, when you're a person that's most admired, you know, do you have somebody, maybe when you were a boy, that you thought a lot of? Well, I'm going to name a person that I've admired for many, many years, <clears throat> and some will differ with me on this. I think he was a great president. He came in at, very, uh, uh, at, a, at a very difficult time and met some difficult situations head on and asked him, and that's Harry Truman. I'm a great admirer of Harry Truman. But you know, that's slow in coming that a lot of people are finding out that he is to be admired. That's right. It takes time for history to get around, doesn't it? Uh, I admired him at that time, and I was one of the few that did, because uh, when he inherited the presidency, as he did during a very difficult time in this country, and had lo so little uh, information as to the position we were in and the posture we occupied, and then following that in the years following the war, he was a great man, and he had great common sense, as we mm. refer to it. And that's a jewel. And to me, it is. It really is. And uh, so I would have to say, in the political arena especially. All right, I'm finding out for myself personally that when you get older and you cross that line of middle age, that... You haven't uh, crossed the middle age line. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you, you get to a point, you, you have to start dreaming again. Right. Uh, do you dream? Oh, I dream constantly. When you quit dreaming, I think you have... Uh, you quit living. Mm -hmm. uh, I have always uh, felt that I personally, my family, and all of us living in Alabama especially, have been blessed beyond that that we deserve. Mm -hmm. I know I have, Jerry. And uh, I have had this desire, and this is maybe inherited both as Betty's father was a country doctor, as I mentioned that, and I know in my father's lifetime, the way he felt, I feel that we are, are obligated and we should feel that we have to return something. All of us have some God-given talents, and we should use the talents that are given us to the best that we can to help our fellow man. And you get back that way, don't you? That's right. It's very rewarding. Thank you so much for being with me today. It's been my pleasure, and I'll always remember Thank you. It. My pleasure. We'll be back right after this message.